Well, hey, welcome everyone. I'm so glad you're tuning in to join us uh, for a chance to worship, which we've been doing, and I hope that you're experiencing in your homes or wherever you're viewing the way that we are, uh, that God is just, he's really filling, at least he was filling my heart through the experience of worship. And we, whether you're tuning in on Facebook Live, on our YouTube channel, or on our website, we're just glad that you're with us, and we hope that God is speaking to you through this worship service and now through his word. Let's, let's bow in prayer and ask God to do just that. Speak to us, shall we? Father God, we do worship you and praise you for who you are. We do recognize that you have called us higher and deeper, and we want to go where you will lead us. And sometimes we're scared, sometimes we're resistant. But for now, in this moment, we want you to lead us, and we want to go where you want us to go as we open your word and ask you to speak to us through it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last uh, weekend, over the holiday weekend, I, my youngest son and I, Benjamin, went on a backpacking trip with my brother-in-law and my nephew. Carried all our food and stuff on our backs and went for three and a half days and, uh, on the trail in the woods. It was a great time. I, at least I enjoy it. Uh, and we had a fun time together. Um, one of the funny things is thinking of things to talk about when you're on the trail, hiking up 10 to 15 miles a day, try to keep your mind off some of the difficult conditions. And one of the debates we got in was what we were going to eat when we got to camp that night. Uh, and just to let you know, we carried our food, so it wasn't steak uh, dinners. These were the freeze-dried camp food uh, called Mountain House Meals. We had three choices. We had chicken teriyaki, we had chili mac, and we had beef stroganoff. Now, none of them were as good as they're probably sounding to you. They're freeze-dried. You, pour, you heat up water, stir it in, and eat it. But we were discussing which one we were going to choose that night. You see an image here of my son sitting there eating, I think, his choice that evening was Chili Mac looking out over the forest below. We had a great spot there. Um, so we're in week two of a series called Choosing Joy. And I've had some debates with some of you uh, in person and um, online about this title. Is joy a choice? Can you really choose it? Is it like choosing which freeze-dried camp meal you want? Uh, I'll take joy, please. I mean, is it that simple? I mean, given the choice, sorrow or joy, who wouldn't choose joy? But is it that easy? Is it that simple? We're living in a period of history in our lifetime when it feels like there's not a lot of joy to be chosen or found. There's lots of reasons for despair, for fear, for insecurity. Can you really choose joy? How do you choose joy, for that matter? If it is a choice, do you just, you know, put on a happy face, just uh, as my grandmother used to say, turn that frown upside down and pretend? Is it ignoring all the sorrow and pain and difficulties and struggles of life? I know people that are like that, honestly, that are always happy and they seem fake about it. And to be honest with you, I don't trust them. Nobody's that happy. No, choosing joy doesn't mean ignoring or denying sorrow. It doesn't mean pretending like everything is okay when it's not, either out there or in here. It's, there are real mental and emotional struggles that we all face at times. Choosing joy means continually recalibrating our hearts or realigning our GPS, spiritually speaking, our compass, back to the person and the work and the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me read to you a quote from a magazine called Psychology Today. People are unhappy today because they view their life as prisons. They feel trapped by aspects of their life, trapped in an unhappy relationship or an unfulfilling job or just generally unhappy with their life despite basic needs being met. This is how most of us have been conditioned to think about joy, that it's based on our circumstances. It's based on how things are going. You don't choose it, it just kind of happens to you as a result of what's going on in your life. You, you experience it now and then, it's fleeting, but you know, it comes and goes. This is not at all how the Bible talks about joy. Let me put it to you this way, in a simple statement, you can have real joy in difficult circumstances when the reason for your joy is not your circumstances. Let me say that again. You can have real, true, lasting joy in the midst of difficult circumstances when the reason for your joy is not your circumstances. 
This is essentially the point of the passage we're going to focus on from Paul's letter to the Philippians, which is really our study called Choosing Joy. is an examination of this book that Paul wrote called uh, the Philippians. It's a letter he wrote to Christians living in the ancient city of Philippi. If you missed it last week, you can go back and watch. That sermon sort of sets up the context for this whole letter uh, and get, bring you up to speed in case it's new to you. So let me read to you verses 12 through 18, our passage from Philippians chapter 1. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Well, what happened to Paul? What's he talking about? What is it that, he, that has happened to him? Well, most of you know, if you were here last week, or if you tuned in, or if you've read this letter before, this is one of four letters in the New Testament that are called prison epistles, prison letters, because Paul wrote them from prison. So Paul is writing this letter to these Christians from prison, specifically speaking, house arrest. He's chained night and day to a Roman imperial guard, but he's, living, he's not in a dungeon necessarily. The circumstances for his arrest and imprisonment are recorded for us in the book of Acts, chapters 22 through 26. We won't get into all the details now, but basically Paul gets arrested in Jerusalem by some angry Jews because he's preaching that Jesus is the Messiah and they don't buy it and they think he's blaspheming. Um, Paul's nephew discovers a plot uh, to kill or assassinate Paul. And so they, the, the, the Roman guard that has Paul under arrest in Jerusalem ships him off to a city called Caesarea where he uh, is, is interrogated by a governor, Felix, there. This is in 58 AD. Eventually, he's shipped again off to Rome where he ends up. He spends two and a half years in prison in Rome, during which time he wrote this letter. The Philippians, who Paul helped establish that church and lead many of them to faith in Jesus Christ, are understandably worried about Paul and about, you might say, the movement, Christianity, the gospel, the church. This is just getting started, and they're probably thinking, like, one of the key leaders is in prison in Rome. What's going to become of this that we're a part of? What's going to happen? Is it over? Has it come to an end? Paul is writing to them to thank them for their concern and their help and to say, in a sense, don't be worried. Don't be discouraged. Actually, what's going on with me is only advancing the cause. It's only advancing the gospel. Now, what's shocking to me about this part of Paul's letter is what's absent from it. Do you know what Paul never says in this letter from prison? Not one time is there any complaining or pleading his case or defending himself or whining, or no, not a whiff of why me, God, after all I've done, why this? No chast, no, 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 he never once does he criticize the Romans even, although he could have. I've been around men in prison. I've done prison ministry before. Do you know what almost every prisoner talks about, every incarcerated person talks about obsessively? Their case. Their, their, the circumstances, what's going on, the possibility of parole, and how could they get an appeal? And that makes sense. Paul doesn't do that. Paul's not focused on that. He's not focused on himself. Honestly, I find this utterly amazing. If I were in jail writing a letter to a group of Christians, to all of you, who I knew could help me, I think my letter would read very different from Paul's. First of all, it would be a lot shorter. I think it would be just six words. Help get me out of here. That's what I would write to you. I would be, wor I want to get out. Paul doesn't do that. Not once. Now, what are we to make of this? Is Paul just, like, is he somehow like a super spiritual space alien? Uh, like a Bible guy that's beyond us? No. He simply understands something that most of us need to learn. And that's this. Joy is consequential, not circumstantial. 
Joy is consequential, not circumstantial. Joy is a consequence of a relationship with Jesus Christ. It flows out of that relationship. We talked about last week, being in Christ is the essence of joy. Joy flows from that grace and peace which is coming to you by being in Christ. It's a consequence of that relationship. It's not based on your present circumstances. One of the key marks, I think, of spiritual maturity in our lives is it can be measured this way. What does it take to steal your joy? How quickly do you go from feeling great about God in your life and, and how much he loves you and his grace and peace to like wondering if he even cares? Where is he? Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this in uh, his book, Preaching and Preachers, in the late 1940s. He wrote, if ever the world needed the witness of Christian joy, it is at this present time, the world is distracted frightened and unhappy and what it needs is to see light shining in the midst of darkness attracting the world rebuking the darkness and showing the way to live with deep security and true joy he wrote that in the aftermath of world war ii i think it's even more relevant today i think it's exactly what our world needs and what god is calling us to I think too many of us that follow Jesus are either entrenched and, and defending ourselves and defending our rights and fighting against the powers that be, and I understand some of those sentiments, or we're holed up and afraid to even now admit that we follow Jesus for fear of what the culture might say. Perhaps the best thing we could do is learn to live with joy, true, lasting, abiding joy, regardless of our circumstances. The book of Psalms says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be known for? What are Christians in our culture known for? Sadly, tragically, it's not often joy. It's no secret that for many, and many researchers have cataloged this and studied this, that most people outside the church and don't, who don't identify as Christ followers, look at Christians, and their primary words they use to describe them are narrow, self-righteous, arrogant, hateful. I cringe at that. I cringe, one, because I know that I know many, many people who that's not true about them. I also cringe because I have to admit that for, for far, in far too many cases, we have been that way. We need to learn what it means to live with joy. Is there anything about my life or about your life that would attract someone to Jesus? I often ask this about social media. Is what I'm about to post going to help someone come to know Christ or hurt that? Is it going to push them away or draw them near? What about my life, my behavior, my thoughts, my words, my speech, my actions? What about yours? Paul reveals three things in these few verses that are at the root of deep joy and the, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Let's walk through them first. A passion for the gospel over present circumstances. A passion for the gospel over present circumstances. Paul has a singular passion for his life. What's your passion in life? What are you most passionate about? You can tell, right? Can you tell what someone's passionate about? For one thing, if you spend time around them, they talk about it incessantly. What, you care, what we care about, we talk about. You just can't help it. So you're around somebody who their kids are their passion. Well, guess what? We're going to talk an awful lot about their kids. Or their business is their passion. What's your passion in life? What do you care most about? What do you think most about? What do you daydream about? What do you talk about? Paul was a man of a singular passion. And do you know what his passion was? It's not a secret. It's all over the first chapter here. It's all over everything he wrote in a word, the gospel. That's two words in English, but it's one word in Greek, euangelion. It literally means glad tidings or good news. The good news about who Jesus is and what he has done and what all of that means. That was Paul's passion and purpose in life. In, in chapter 1, verse 5, he calls us partners in the gospel. In verse 12, he says he's to advance the gospel. In verse 16, put here to defend the gospel. In verse 27, to live a life worthy of the gospel. In verse 27, at the end, serving uh, for the faith of the gospel. This is just chapter 1 of Philippians. In every book that he wrote, 
He talks about the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, Paul writes to Christians living in Rome who he's never visited but longs to visit them. And he says, I hope by God's grace I may come to you to preach the gospel there. It's always in my ambition, he says, to preach the gospel to you in Rome. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power unto salvation to all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Greek, he says. The gospel. And by the way, Paul's passion and longing to preach in Rome came true but not the way he thought. His chains made it true. He was taken there in chains. So God did fulfill that passion, but not the way he assumed it would happen. In other words, this is what Paul cares about, so this is what he's focused on and what he's thinking about, not his present circumstances or being chained to a Roman guard night and day. Let me read to you verses 12 and 14 once more. 12 through 14. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Boy, there's a lot in these, these, just these three verses. First of all, the Greek word here for advance, when he says that what, what's happened, meaning my imprisonment, has served to advance the gospel. The Greek word for advance is the word uh, prokope. Uh, and it literally means to go before to, or to clear the way. And it was a specific military term used to refer to the advanced guard that went ahead of the, the main army. And they would clear the road of obstacles. They would scout for enemy. They would clear trees, boulders, brush, clear the path for the whole army to march. In other words, the army carried Caesar's agenda, his power, as it were, his standard. And so the advance team went ahead to make smooth the path for them. Paul is saying, and this is astounding, he's saying, my chains, my imprisonment is actually God's advance team. It's actually, can you believe this, gone ahead of me to prepare the way for God's agenda to march. Who would have thought? Only God. He's removing obstacles. This is remarkable what Paul's saying. In verse 13, it's for those outside of the church. He says, in verse 13 specifically, so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard. What's that? The imperial guard is the Praetorian guard. If you ever seen the movie Gladiator, you know that Russell Crowe's character was the leader of the Praetorian Guard. He was the general of, of legions. The Praetorian Guard was like um, Roman special forces. The best of the best, the elite troops that were served as Caesar's bodyguards in his household and did his on his specific errands. If a prisoner was being transported to stand before Caesar, which Paul was, he would be under imperial guard day and night. So most scholars, most historians uh, tell us that Paul would have been chained on six to eight hour rotations to a different imperial guard. They would rotate. That's fascinating. I wonder what they talked about for six to eight hours chained at the wrist together. What do you think Paul talked about for six to eight hours chained to a Roman guard? Hmm, I, I wonder. Do you think it might have been the gospel? Nonstop? How you doing, Mr. Paul? Fine. Have I told you about the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for your sins? Yes, you told me last and shift. And he's on and on. Paul talks about the gospel. And some of these guards come to believe. You know how I know this is true? If you go to the end of the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 22, Paul, and when he's signing off a letter, he says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. How in the world would the gospel get into Caesar's household and convert people? I... It's very clear. Paul's chained night and day to imperial guards who serve in Caesar's household. And some of them are coming to faith in Jesus. Why? Because of Paul's passion. His passion for the gospel. He can't stop talking about it. When I was, uh, years ago, went to visit the Louisiana State Penitentiary called Angola. Massive 6,000 inmates, six different camps. I met some remarkable men, some very scary individuals and some humble Christ-filled individuals. One of them, his name was Ron Hicks. Ron's an inmate pastor, and he came to faith in Jesus while in prison. He said when he got off the bus there for the first time, knowing he's going to spend the rest of his life behind these, this razor wire, he was terrified. It was the bloodiest prison in America at that time. But over time, he was led to faith in Jesus by some other inmates. His life was transformed. And he said, my burning passion when I came to know Jesus was to tell other people about him. 
He said, but at first I felt trapped. I felt, wow, I'm in prison. I'll never get out. How could I tell people about him? And then he said, one night God spoke to him and says, you don't have to get out because they're going to keep bringing them in. And I want you to be the first one to meet them when they get off the bus. So they don't hear a message of fear, but a message of hope and of grace. And that's Ron Hicks' passion, his singular passion, God using him in that place. The point is, God can use even those things which we would understandably see as setbacks or devastations or or things that would derail us to advance his mission if we let him. In verse 14, Paul goes on and says that the other brothers, and most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment and are much more, more bold to speak the word without fear. What does this tell you? It tells you before this, they were a little timid. They were a little afraid. They didn't speak the word with boldness. They were in fear. Paul is saying that his chains have actually strengthened and emboldened other people who aren't chained. It had the opposite effect. You might think, well, those people would say, look, what happened to Paul could happen to me. I'm nervous to speak out in Rome. I don't want to end up in prison. I better keep my mouth shut. But the opposite happened. They saw the way God used Paul, even in Caesar's household, and they thought, well, maybe he could use me. Maybe he could use me as well. And that happens, doesn't it? You get around Christians who are bold with their faith. It, it, it's encouraging. It's inspiring. I remember going to Russia many years ago. We had supported a church uh, in Samara, Russia for years, and they had outlasted communism. They were celebrating their centennial. I went with a delegation from our church to help celebrate their 100-year anniversary. I met some amazing saints in the Lord who aren't going to be in books, bestsellers. They are in heaven, but they're heroes. One older man named Victor who had spent part of his life smuggling Bibles into that country so his children and grandchildren could have the word of God. He spent time in prison for it. He was denied work for it. His children were denied entrance to university for it. But he told with joy and tears in his eyes about what, what, the, what a privilege it was to serve God in that way. Also, a strange side note, Russian, Russian men in the church greet each other with a kiss. And they, I did not know this. And little Victor grabbed me by the neck and pulled me down. He's remarkably strong for a small Russian man. And as he pulled my neck down, I got my head just turned to the side the last minute, and he got me right there. But anyway, in case you go to Russia and meet uh, some older men in the church, be prepared for that. He's a hero. I, I felt humbled to be in his presence. You know, he asked me, he says, Brother Jeff, uh, through a translator, can you teach us how to, how to, be, how to minister in a free country? Because most of our life has been under communism, and now that, that Russia's open, we don't know how to, how to do that. What am I going to say to this man who risked everything to get the word of God to the next generation? I felt encouraged just by being around his faith, and I, I thought, when I come, God, forgive me for being so timid. That's what's happening here for these men, Paul says, that have watched him in his chains. They're being encouraged and emboldened to speak without fear. Second thing Paul gives us is the purpose of Jesus over personal comfort. The purpose of Jesus over his personal comfort. Passion and purpose go hand in glove. The one feeds the other. Your passion fuels your purpose in life. In verse 16, Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 16, he says, um, The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Paul understood where's the here he's talking about. Not just on earth, but here in this situation, in, in chains. For what? For a singular purpose. For the defense of the gospel. Paul actually saw his adversity as part of God's transforming work in him and through him. He's not saying, why did this have to happen? Just when we were starting to make, gain some traction, just when this was, church thing was getting going, just when you're starting to use me, God, why now? It's the opposite. He said, God, this is an opportunity. My father-in-law uh, is been battling cancer and illness for a long time. I remember when he first went through chemotherapy, we gathered as a family in my sister-in-law's house uh, to pray every Sunday night. It's a great time to come together as a family to seek God's will and healing for my father-in-law. And we had a, took a photo one of those prayer nights. We had, would have dinner and pray together. We took a family photo, and my father-in-law kept that photo and put it by his bed whenever he went in for chemo treatments. And he used that photo as a conversation starter with his nurses, his caretakers, whoever would come by. They would ask invariably, Who, is that your family? He'd say, yes, that's actually my prayer team. 
And he talked to them about prayer, about faith, and ultimately about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He saw his chemotherapy, which nobody wants to go through, as an opportunity because he wasn't focused just on his circumstances. I once heard Pastor Tony Evans, an African-American pastor who I love to listen to but can't preach like at all, but he he said it like this, and I love this line. He said, Paul's confinement was God's assignment. (laughs) I'm nowhere near as good as Tony Evans, but I love that phrase. Paul's confinement was God's assignment. The truth is I just don't see it that way in my life. I see things as inconveniences, as hassles. The job you feel stuck in. The family you feel trapped in. The person you wish you were rid of. Now, I'm not talking about an abusive relationship where you're being harmed or someone else is. I'm talking about just circumstances that you wish were different. Maybe, perhaps, you're not trapped, but you're placed there for a purpose. And even if God didn't place you there, he can still use you there if you'll allow him. Ravi Zacharias tells the story about when he was a young seminarian and in 1971 he went uh, to Vietnam and he traveled with a translator uh, who was just a teenager named uh, Hien, Pan, Hien Pan. Hien was uh, just a teenager and it was his translator in English and they traveled the country speaking and sharing the word of God and, and Ravi says remarkable things happen. Well he left of course and went back to the States and later when the communists took over, Hien Pan was imprisoned in a communist prison camp and he was, uh, for collaborating with the Americans. He was indoctrinated every day, day and night, with communist uh, propaganda. And over time, it wore him down. He began to think, maybe the Westerners lied to me. Maybe the gospel isn't real. Maybe God doesn't exist. Maybe this whole thing was a lie. And, and, and his incarceration was brutal and harsh, and he thought, why isn't God helping me? And one day he decided, I'm done. I'm not going to pray anymore. He was assigned the next day to latrine duty, cleaning prison latrines, a horrible job. And while doing that, in one of the filthy cans, he found a piece of paper that had English writing on it. He was one of the few in the prison that could read English. He was a translator, remember. Pulled it out, and it was a page out of the New Testament from the book of Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demon, nor heaven, nor hell, nor height, you know, nor death, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He read those words. He began to weep, and he knew that God was real. He begged for God's forgiveness. He cleaned that off, hid it in his pocket, and every night would read that. He requested to go back to prison, to latrine duty every day. Who does that? he discovered that some of the prison guards were using a confiscated English Bible as toilet paper. And over a course of weeks and months, out of that filth, he rescued the word of God, cleaned it off, and put together his own portion of the New Testament and some of the Old Testament, which he read day and night. And he read two other prisoners and witnessed to them and shared Christ, even some of the guards. The purpose of Jesus over personal comfort. And then when he was released, finally, he was making plans to escape the country and, uh, and go back uh, and sail uh, to get to some asylum and, and, and escape the Communist Party. Though some of those guards came to his home and had heard about the plot and asked him. He denied it and lied and they left. And he felt convicted by God. God, I, I, I told you that if, if you were true to me, I would, be, I would be honest about you. I wouldn't be afraid. And he felt convicted to tell them the truth. They came back the next day, and he admitted that he was planning to escape. And they said, we wanted to join you. They were so compelled by his message. They joined him, and it turns out those guards were experienced sailors. On their voyage to get free, they experienced a terrible storm, which Hien Pan said would have destroyed the boat and killed them all had it not been for those two guards who knew how to sail in rough seas. Now, I know that's a miraculous story. But God can use any circumstances for his purposes, even the ones we would not choose and don't like if we let him. Third, the power of the gospel over personal reputation. The power of the gospel over personal reputation. So apparently when Paul is, uh, there were some jealousies and rivalries. Can you imagine that in the church, jealousy and rivalry? I, I can't imagine such a thing. It doesn't happen today, of course. But there were with Paul, um, and he writes this in verses 17 and 18. He says, The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, 
not sincerely but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. So Paul is saying, it really doesn't matter what people think and say about me. What matters is what they think and say about Jesus. Boy, I've been reflecting on that this week. Can you say that? Can I say that? Not, not always. It's a question I've been thinking about. What matters more to me? The reputation of Jesus or the reputation of Jeff? For Paul, he's saying, look, some of these people are preaching the truth and they're doing it out of goodwill. Some of them are preaching. They're preaching the truth. The content is good. But I know their motives are to, to usurp me or to put me down or to harm me in some way. And Paul's saying, look, don't even worry about that. What matters is the message they're proclaiming. Now, don't misunderstand. This doesn't mean the character of the messenger doesn't matter. Of course, our character, if we're going to witness to the world, our life should, should measure up in some degree to the message we proclaim. But nobody's perfect. The point is that God can use insecure, prideful, broken messengers. I'm trusting him to do that right now. God can. That's, that's pretty much the only kind of messengers God has to work with, really. In our culture, right now, we dismiss any message if we don't like something about the messenger. I don't like that guy's political views. Therefore, anything he might say or she might say is therefore wrong and I can't listen. I don't like her Instagram post. I don't like this about them. I'm not so sure that about you know, something they did in the past and therefore cancel everything they have to say. Paul's saying, look, my passion is the gospel. My purpose is to communicate the gospel. And so I'm okay with the fact that some people don't like me. I'm okay with some, some people might be jealous and have rivalries. Maybe there's something in me that needs to change. What matters is the gospel. What matters is the power of God and his love and mercy and grace going out into the world. That's what matters. That's what's important. That's what I care about. Don't lose sight of that. Because if you do lose sight of that, then joy does become circumstantial. It does become, well, oh, how's it going for me? Who likes me? How many followers do I have? Is my, is my life, am I winning at life? Paul finishes by saying, verse 18, he will rejoice twi two times. He says he will rejoice. Let me be clear. Paul is not rejoicing because he's in prison. He's not suggesting that as a methodology for ministry. He's not rejoicing because some people are jealous of him or don't like him. He's not rejoicing because he's had to face hardships and will again. He's rejoicing because Christ is being proclaimed and it's changing lives. Paul may be in chains, but the gospel is not. Paul may be chained to a Roman guard and in prison and have his freedoms restricted, but the power of God is not restricted. The message is not in chains. No one can chain it and no one has yet managed to stop it and no one will. Because it's the power of God and the salvation. So let me speak as we close to those of you who maybe in your own way you feel a little chained. Maybe you feel chained in a job that you, that you hate. And you're focused on getting out of it. Looking for something quote unquote better. I'm not telling you not to look for a new job. But maybe while you're in this one, you might see your chains as an opportunity. By your work ethic by your kindness, by your service, by your love, and by your witness. Maybe, uh, maybe you're a young mom, and you had a college education and a career, and you gave that up to raise a family, and, and it was what you thought you wanted, and now you feel kind of trapped. And, it's, not, and it's, it's a struggle at times. Maybe you would, while acknowledging this is hard, you'd see that those chains aren't necessarily restrictive. It could be an opportunity. God can use you. Maybe you're chained to your success. I've talked to men who have said, they, and, and women who have built businesses and it's become so successful. And they said, like, I'd like to be more involved in the church, but I'm kind of a slave to this thing that I've built. And there's, I have employees and I've got projects and I just can't get away from it. Maybe you might see that very company that God blessed you with, not as chains which keep you from his work, but as his work, as an opportunity to witness to your employees and bless them. Maybe like my father-in-law, you're battling an illness or a disease 
and you feel trapped and you feel chained, perhaps God can use your suffering, I know he can, for his glory, for his gospel. Maybe you feel chained to your past. Whatever the case is, God can use any circumstances, even the most difficult of circumstances, to promote his agenda, to further his gospel. And he can do it through you and through me. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge and, 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 and confess that we often care more about our reputation than yours. We often care more about our circumstances than your gospel. Forgive us for that. We're frail people. Lift our eyes and reignite our passion, our singular passion to be you, Lord, and your purpose. Help us to see that even the hard, painful, difficult things which we would never choose in our lives can be used for your glory if we'll but yet lift our eyes to you. Thank you that, Lord Jesus, the cross that you bore, the grave, what you endured, you did because of your passion for your glory and for our good. We are eternally grateful. We praise you in your name. Amen.